So good morning, everybody. This is a great pleasure to be here with all of you. We are starting now the third meeting of our HUST UFMG workshops. So it's a pleasure to have here Professor Simone Weimar and Cassio Turra from Federal University of Minas Gerais and Professor Jean Young from Hearst University. They will be presenting here. And today we are going to talk about demographics and pension system. So I would like to invite, first I would like to invite Bernardo Campolina to open our session, please. The Dean of the CEDEPLA. And I, will, I would also like to thank you everybody for being here to attending our meeting. Thank you, Monica. I'd like to uh, welcome all uh, here. Uh, a good evening for those in China. A good morning for those in Brazil. It's a pleasure for CEDEPLA to uh, join together. This is the third uh, workshop we've, we've been putting together today uh, about uh, population and demographic studies. Uh, and we're very, uh, we're looking forward uh, to see the development uh, of this cooperation that started last semester. And uh, we hope we hope we have a good session here today. So uh, I'd like to thank the, the ones that are gonna speak, Cassio, Monica, and Professor Jin Yang. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, have a nice uh, seminar workshop here today. Thank you, Monica. I'll give the, the, the floor back to you. Thank you so much, Bernardo. I would like to invite now Professor Liu from Confucius Institute. Uh, 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 and I also would like to, to, to thank you, Professor Liu and Professor Miria, that is the Dean of, of the Confucius, Brazilian Dean of the Confucius Institute. Uh, for the support for this meeting uh, and for these workshops. And so please, Professor Liu, can you? Professor Liu, oh, we are not hearing you. Please, can you open your microphone? OK. OK. Good morning, Professor Monica. Good morning. And good, good evening for professors from HUST. Um, it's really a great pleasure to participate in the in the workshop uh, by the School of Economics of both universities. And uh, we can say last year we have got very successful uh, workshops. Uh, and, and this year, this come to the third session of the, of the workshop. And uh, we should say that today, um, population, study and the pension system, this is really a very important issue. Uh, that is because it's, uh, we can say, uh, aging problem is really a serious problem in developed and even in developing countries like China. So we can say uh, to, for, for the beneficial, uh, we can say, well, and effective development of the economy, uh, we need to pay more attention to the population the relation between population and also the pension system, and uh, and we hope this session can be very su su successful. At the same time, um, I really would like to uh, invite you uh, to attend our tenth anniversary on uh, November from the twenty from the twentieth to the twenty fourth, and actually we have got uh, uh, two days. Two days for the seminars. Uh, then we've got three days for the celebration. So I, I hope the professors from China can come here and we can sit together to have further discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Liu. So uh, we are going to start now, just uh, uh, our schedule. So uh, Professor Jin Yang is going to start. We You have 30 minutes, and then after Professor Cassio Turra and Simone Weimar will be from the Federal University of Minas Gerais. And then we have 30 minutes for discussion. So
So thank you so much for uh, coming and, and being here with us. And so this is your time, Professor Jin Yang. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Monica, for hosting this uh, great uh, conference. And I also appreciate uh, very well the warm remarks from uh, uh, Dean Liu and Dean Bernardo. So uh, I'm going to share the screen now. Uh, can you see my screen? Okay, so this is my screen. this is an email. Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, cool. So um, today I'm going to uh, uh, talk about the topic that we have previously worked, uh, uh, which is the social pension uh, reform in China. And this, uh, I'm very happy to kick off their uh, presentation today. And uh, uh, this pay, uh, this project is co-authored with uh, Professor Chen Xi or Xi Chen from Yale University. And basically we examine uh, we introduced how the, uh, the pension reform was ruled out uh, during the national pilot in, 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 in between 2009 and 2012 and uh, how it would affect the child health in, in China. So as we know that uh, during the past decades, China has experienced a, a very huge improvement or a dramatic uh, improvement in uh, not only health, but economic growth and in many other aspects like education uh, and et cetera. But uh, during the same time, uh, we also witnessed uh, huge uh, inequalities uh, among regions, like uh, in terms of the life ex expectancy, we, will, uh, we see that uh, for the Eastern coastal areas, the life expectancy uh, had, is a few years longer than the middle and the Western areas. And this kind of, uh, this period does not happen between the eastern and the west, middle and the western area, but also, uh, but it also happens between the urban and rural areas as well. Um, so basically, the rural residents enjoy a longer life expectancy and better health. And but at the same time, there's also another uh, phenomenon we call the about a double burden of malnutrition, not only at the individual level, but the regional and national levels as well. I will introduce here what is the double burden. So in this uh, graph, I show the, um, the, the, the hyper-HZ score for the boys and the girls uh, divided by an urban and rural uh, residency. So on the uh, vertical axis, it's the height for, uh, of the children transformed into the Z-score according to the WHO standard. And on the horizontal axis, it is the age of the children uh, from six months to 144 months, which equal uh, 12 years. So um, it's apparent that uh, when looking at this graph, we, we can conclude that um, the urban uh, children, uh, regardless of the gender, uh, have uh, are enjoying much uh, higher height for age uh, they score than the, their uh, rural counterparts. But at the same time, when we look at the weight of the children, which is measured here by the BMI, they score because like for children, it, uh, the BMI is not a stable measurement of their weight. So we transform into the WHO standard of a BMI Z score. And interestingly, we find for those under all the children under uh, 12 years old, uh, they seems to, the, the rural children seems to be slightly or moderately higher or have larger weight than their urban counterparts. So which means that probably they have even higher rate of overweight or obesity. So this sort of like both uh, nutritional insufficiency and nutritional imbalance uh, in the rural areas is a very critical problem. So um, uh, this is mainly due to the gap, not only across regions, but the within regions as well. So if we look at some data, in like in uh, around the 2010s, which is also the sample period of our study, we have uh, seen that over 33% of elementary school children have anemia in Western China. But at the same time, around 20% of rural children aged between two to six years 
and 14.2% of rural children aged between 7 to 12 years are actually overweight or obese uh, during about, about the same time period. So now the problem becomes like for the countries like China, which is still a developing country, but still have a problem of uh, undernutrition for children, how to improve the childhood nutrition, especially in the rural areas, but also avoid the uh, overweight or obesity, uh, the prevalence of the overweight or obesity. Uh, now it becomes a very critical question. So, but it come when we uh, comes to the Chinese context, one significant effect that cannot be ignored, which is the uh, grandparents and grandchild coresses uh, do uh, some, uh, somehow uh, due to their consistency of our culture and history uh, in a long time uh, and about the Confucius social norms. So in 2020, over 280 million rural residents actually work in the urban sectors, but sarcastically, um, doing the same, uh, most of them uh, cannot bring their children into the city. So they have their children left behind still in the rural areas. So in two, so this is mainly um, due to their uh, lack of public services in the urban areas, especially uh, the, the educational system, and they do not accept the rural uh, migrant children into the system, educational system. So in 2015, over 40 million uh, rural children under uh, 17 live uh, with their uh, live in their original domicile without either of both parents due to parental migration, and partially due to this uh, huge uh, you know rural to urban migration, uh, we have seen a very large uh, rate of grandparents and grandchild coresses. Here I show the data from the China Family Panel Studies, which is a, a national representative uh, survey uh, since 2010. And here I plot the coresidence rate of the elderly with uh, children, uh, with children at 12 by their age groups. So interestingly, we find that even for those uh, elderly, like over uh, 60, like uh, between six, 60 and 64, the coresidence rate is very high, over 45. And it seems that this coresidence rate is increasing slightly over time, not just decreasing, but increasing uh, from 20, 2012 uh, to, to 2014. So uh, because of the, because of the uh, inignorable uh, uh, phenomena of the grandparents and the grandchild coresidence. Uh, it should be the uh, we we then uh, look at the case where whether the grandparents are actually playing a role in taking care of the children. So we then plot the um the the share of the main caregivers for the rural child and the child, and uh, and we find that you know uh, apparently the mothers are the uh, have the largest share being the main caregivers of the rural children. But at the same time, we find that grandparents for the for, for over 30% of the rural children, grandparents instead of their mothers are actually their main caregivers. Uh, so this is a very uh, uh, sub uh, substantial uh, amount of share of uh, children. But we, we, when we look at the nine time main caregivers, then it, 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 it comes to a similar story, even though the, uh, the, the rule of mothers increased uh, uh, a, a lot, but also we don't see any significant decrease in the share of grandparents being the main child caregivers at nine time. So it's still around 30%. So it's noteworthy that for those grandparents who take care of the children during nighttime, they are also very likely to be the main caregivers during daytime. So that is to say that for around or more than 30% of the children, actually their grandparents' knowledge, their grandparents' time allocation would have a very significant effect on the, on the, on the behavior and the health outcomes of the children. 
So now we come to the policy, why we, uh, we, we want to focus on the uh, social pension uh, policy in China. Uh, the new rural pension scheme is a nationwide social pension program that aims to enroll the rural population in China. Uh, it was designed to incorporate two parts, uh, a non-contributory social pension benefit and a voluntary defined contribution pension savings scheme. So residents basically with the rural registration or we call the hukou type are all eligible to enroll into this program. And for the enrollees over age 60, they are eligible to receive a non-contributory pension set by the central government, which is the minimum amount of 55 Chinese yuan or about $8 per month. But this amount was uh, increasing over time. It increased to at least uh, 70 Chinese yuan in 2014, and for now it's over 100 yuan uh, at a national level. But in many local areas, actually, this amount uh, is, is much higher than the national minimum because this is uh, only a bar for the national uh, at the national level. So in 2014, uh, the, the policy was also was integrated. Uh, with, uh, in, uh, with another social pension program which covers the rural uh, uh, urban residents. So in the, the problem is called the urban resident pension scheme, uh, which mainly covers uh, the urban unemployees and uh, self-employees. So the, the two policies were integrated into the one uh, program, which is called the urban and the rural resident pension scheme. So here I captured a picture from one of my previous studies that were examining the timing of this uh, uh, social uh, pi national pilot. So the national pilot actually started in 2009, but we can see that in the first two years, uh, only a small uh, share of the counties participated in this national pilot. In this figure, I show the, uh, the dark areas or the dark counties are actually the, um, the counties who, uh, who, who participate in the early years and the light colors are those who participate in the last two years. So mainly most of the counties actually participated in the last two years. And also during the first two years, um, so this is a number by the end of the year. So mainly during the first two years, the participation rate was also uh, very low. And, it, and then it increased it steadily in the following years. So here I show how the participation rates uh, uh, changed over time. So here I plot the, um, the, the, the participation rate by their age groups and also by the year as well. You can see that for this solid line, which indicates the year 2010, the participation rate uh, was very low even for those who are aged over 60. But then the, the, the share increased substantially to over 40% um, in the year 2012 and 2014. So uh, now we, ex we, we come to the, ask the question whether this social pension reform uh, or this program would affect the child health in the rural areas, areas uh, through an uh, intergenerational channel uh, actually, many studies, uh, previous studies, have studied on how cash transfers have uh, have affected the child health, but uh, but less of them uh, have examined the multi generational impacts. One of the studies, pioneering studies, is from Duflo in two thousand three, and she examined the uh, old age pension uh, program in South Africa, which is also a social pension program. But there is some a difference between her study and ours. Um, uh, first, even though both uh, pension policies ruled out in a few years, uh, like the NRPS, it started in 2009 and then take like four years to be um, to be in full win in China in 2012. Um, but the amount of these two programs are significantly or has a big difference uh, for the OAP, the amount of social pension incomes is twice the median per capita income of Africans in rural areas. But for the NRPS, 
the the amount is uh, accounts for uh, only around ten percent of their rural household in income per capita. So the amount here in China is like uh, compared uh, relatively much smaller. Also, uh, for the OAP, it's mean tested, which means that uh, the household have to uh, fulfill a few uh, requirements and the conditions in order to get uh, the pension. And but in China, it's, uh, it's sort of universal for all rural uh, residents. And also, fertility rate is high in South Africa, but in China, um, the, the even in the rural areas, the fertility rate is uh, uh, relatively low due to their one-child policy. Um, so now it's uh, so many studies actually in China have found that uh, co-residence of grandparents uh, has increased the grandchild weight, uh, and, and the effect is large, larger, especially in the rural areas. So in complementary to the previous studies, so our country, uh, potential contributions is as follows. First, uh, we find that receiving pension by grandfathers only have a short-term impact on grandson's health. This is in contrast to Duflo's findings that in South Africa, uh, this is through a female link, but here in our study, we find a male to male link. And we will explain the me mechanism later. And the second contribution is that the cash transfer uh, has some unintended consequence on the child obesity uh, in, the, in the context of, of a developing country like China. Uh, previous studies find that uh, kind of policy effect like the SNAP program in the United States uh, as a uh, developed country, but this is a, uh, one of the few studies find this uh, sort of effect in a developing country. So the data we use come from the China Family Panel Study, which is a nationwide biannual survey of Chinese households since 2010. It covers uh, 25 provinces by that time and 95% of the total population of the country. And its 2010 wave consist, uh, constitutes of uh, 14, around uh, 15,000 uh, households and 42,000 individuals. We compiled the wave 2012 and the 14 data and matched the children under age 12, uh, as we see they are more likely to, share, to, to experience the double burden, and match their information with their uh, grandparents. We exclude the wave 2010 because by then only uh, 56 counties were covered by an IPS in our sample and the participation rates were very low. And the criteria of the sample cleaning, including first, uh, the child age under six months were, are, are excluded due to the concern on the measurement error of the height and the uh, weight. And also we exclude uh, children with BMI Z scores uh, on the top and the bottom uh, one person tiles uh, in concerning of the um, outliers. And we also exclude children BMI beyond the range from 7.5 to 60, and we also keep their, uh, uh, we, we only keep their children with rural hookah type or a uh, rural household registration type. Okay. Um, here I will show some of the uh, summary data statistics of the, the children in our sample. And we divide their uh, children by their um, pension, household pension uh, receipt status. So in the first column, it shows that um, uh, either the male or a female in the household has received the social pension. And the last column shows that whether uh, uh, none of the household members actually has received the pension. Uh, and we do also peer-wise t-test to see whether they have, there is any significant uh, difference between the two groups. We find for many of the outcomes like uh, uh, BMI Z score actually the um, the, the 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 household pension receipt pro, uh, group has a higher um, BMI and also like a higher um, obesity rate, but the and higher overweight rate. But actually, these uh, outcomes are cannot be uh, statistically significant by using a simple uh, t test. And also we have seen that for this household, the children is also has a lower 
um, uh, lower HYPO age uh, z-score. But it may be because the, the, the two groups of children have uh, also differential characteristics in terms of the household backgrounds and uh, family or family, you know, a structure, demographic structure. So we then, uh, we here the, the, the table shows the summary of those um, household, um, you know, family structure and the household backgrounds. We, we see that for uh, those uh, who participate, children who participate in, uh, in this program, the fathers are also sort of uh, older, uh, older age and the mother with older age and the father's education uh, are similar, but um, the mother's education is, uh, is less and they're also less likely to live in the urban areas. So I also we all, we also summarized their household demographic structure in the paper, but due to the time limit, I do not show it uh, in this presentation. So now uh, we introduce how we examine the, uh, the the effect. So the equation one on the left hand side it's the outcome of the children. The I indicates the child, and J indicates the household. And the C indicated the county where the household located located in, and the T is the a year of the survey. And here uh, on the right hand side, the NIPS, which indicates the um, social pension receipt status, is our treatment variable. And we uh, also include other variables, uh, control other variables like the dummies of the age and the gender of the children and also the household uh, characteristics like their location, father and the mother's age and edu education and how household demographic structure like the number of members within the age groups such as between like uh, 6 to 12, 12 to 18, 18 to 25, 25 to 49 and above 50 such uh, etc. So in order to differentiate the effect of uh, male pensioners from the female pensioners in equation two, we replace the NRPS with NRPS male and NRPS female, which indicated whether there is a male receiving the pension income and the female is receiving the pension income separately. And we also control for the county fixed effect and the time fixed effect in our model. And we, we take advantage of the um, exogenous variation in the design that actually those, uh, there's a, a cutoff the, of age at uh, 60. So only for those, uh, for the older elders who are older than, uh, than 60 are eligible to receive the pension. We, so we use the dummy variable indicating the existence of, of eligible household member as an instrument for NRPS uh, pension receipt status. So here uh, in equation three shows the first stage um, uh, regression equation. So uh, accordingly, uh, in order to uh, differentiate the effects of um, uh, female males from females, so in equation four and five, we uh, use uh, their eligibility status uh, of males and the females separately as the instruments for the male and the female pension receipts um, separately. So um, here I will show you the, sorry, I think I can, oh yeah, I can move on now. So here in this table, I show the first stage regression. Uh, so uh, it's very consistent that this effect is around uh, 40, around 40. Uh, 40 uh, around 45 to 46 so being which is to say that being able to being eligible for this pension uh, actually increases the, pen, the likelihood of receiving a pension by around 40 percent and this effect is also stable for uh, for, for for either of the gender for example the effect of male eligibility for male pension receipts at around 40 and that effect for the female uh uh, female pension receipts is also around the 40. So it, there's no big difference between the intent to receive the uh, intention to receive the pension. And this uh, first stage result is very uh, robust uh, across all the 
um, specifications of the model when we add or drop some of the variables or add or drop uh, the, the, the fixed effect. And the F statistics is apparently very strong uh, to show that this is a relevant um, instrument. So here I want to show you the density, uh, the, the density of the BMI scores for the boys and the girls. Uh, to so dark, the dark solid line actually shows the density for those uh, boys who are eligible uh, but have not received a pension. So you will you will see that these boys actually have lower BMI Z score than those who are eligible but have male pension receipts. And those for those uh, who have female pension receipt, they are kind of between the black and the blue lines. But but this not but we do not observe such pattern in the girls subsample. So interestingly, we 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 may suspect that the effect uh, could be um, more significant in the boys uh, subsample. But now before that, we are I'm going to show you the uh, overall impact. So in the in the panel A of this table, we we just simply run the regression of the uh, of the of the child birth. Uh, both, uh, not birth outcome, the, the child BMI Z score on the pension receipt uh, with, uh, with, with or without the controls here in the table. And we see that even though those effects are positive, but um, they are not statistically significant, um, probably uh, partially due to the uh, selection of the participation into this program. But once we use the uh, two-stage least the square, uh, which is the uh, which is the exogenous variation of the eligibility, age eligibility. Then we find that effect is magnified, uh, and also it becomes uh, statistic statistically significant. The impact is around 0.9, which means that receiving the pension uh, of the household would have to increase the child BMI Z score by 0.9 which is a very uh, substantial impact actually. So when we differentiate the effect of the gender in the last two columns, uh, we actually find that the impact is very significant uh, for, the, for, the, for the male pension receipt. Uh, it's, over, it's, it's a rather similar impact with the, uh, to the overall effect. But when we look at the effect of the female pensioner, then it's very close to zero and uh, with a large standard error. So uh, the, we, we suspect that it, this effect is mainly driven by the male pensioners in a sample. Okay, okay. So then now we are concerned that whether the, there is some distributional effect of this policy. So we divide, uh, uh, not divide, we just uh, measure the uh, overweight and obesity and underweight of the uh, of the of the children in our sample, and then we examine separately how the policy would affect the overweight, underweight, and obesity uh, of the children. And we find this effect is more salient uh, to 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 be uh, when we measured by overweight and obesity, which means that this policy could have a very uh, could have a significant effect on their uh, overweight rate and obesity rate in the rural areas, but without any improvement in their underweight. So uh, we, now, we now come to the height, and um, if, if this policy could uh, have such a big uh, you know, improvement in the child nutrition, it will not only affect the child weight, but the height as well. But unfortunately, when we look at the result on the child height, we have not seen any significant result here. Uh, either we look at a full sample result or we look at the subsample result by the gender of the children. And we then tend to the stunting, uh, to, 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 to the outcome of the child stunting, which is measured by whether the hypo AZ score is below negative two. And still we couldn't find any um, uh, effect that this policy improved the child height, height uh, in the rural areas. And then it comes to the subsample analysis for um, the rural children in terms of their, um, in terms of their uh, uh, weight outcomes. 
And interestingly, we find these outcomes is actually larger and more statistic, uh, statistically uh, have more statistical significance in the boy subsample. So we regard uh, uh, no matter how we measure the outcome, like using the BMI, overweight, or obesity, these effects are all statistically significant and uh, uh, very similar to our baseline result. But when it comes to the girl subsample, even though these effects are positive, but comparing to the boy subsample, their level relatively smaller and with a large standard error. So it turns out these are unprecisely predictive. Then we examine, we do some robustness check. As you know that the, the pension program would uh, have, a, have a potential channel to affect the child has prob probably uh, being through the channel of the household formation or household structure, because that the eligible, eligible status over, uh, uh, over of the uh, household member may also indicate that this is a multi-generational household. And that could also affect the child health at the same time. So to overcome such kind of endogeneity problem of the uh, to, of the instrument, we 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 instead take the predetermined household members eligibility. So which is to say that because our sample uh, uh, it's a CFPS started in 2010, and our sample period is from 2012 and uh, 14. And the CFTS were to follow all the core household members started from 2010. So we can actually track the coincidence of the household members uh, during, uh, for, for those in our sample, uh, even in 2010. So we use their coincidence uh, status in 2010 and construct their eligibility uh, by their age, uh, regardless of the coincidence in our sample period. So, and use that as an instrument for the pension receipt. And we re-examine the, the model and find that even though the impact, um, the impact dropped slightly, but it's still um, statistically significant, which may partly relieve that um, the endogeneity of the household formation. And we further test this, uh, you know, uh, one may uh, may be concerned that you know uh, the, the, due to the lack of social pension uh, or social security system in the rural areas, there's some sorting behavior maybe uh, of their among the elderly who may invest in one of their child because uh, they want to have uh, you know due to the social security uh, lack of the social security they may invest in one of the adult child and live wisdom during their elder life and to, to get a life support. If that is the case, then the child, the adult child who co-reside with the elderly actually would have to be, uh, probably have better health outcomes. And also their, their children or grandchildren are more likely to have better health outcomes, right? So if that sorting effect is true, then we have to examine whether our sample, uh, our result is driven by that sorting behavior. So to overcome that, that concern, uh, to relieve that concern, we use the um, eligibility, we construct the uh, variable of the grandparent eligibility, which is the eligible eligibility status of any grandparent of the grandchildren, which means that uh, normally a grandchild would have four grandparents. So we actually collect the all uh, the age information of the grandparents and the measure whether one of them are eligible for the pension. So, and then we run the OLS uh, of the child outcome, house outcomes on those uh, eligible uh, eligibility status. So by doing this, we are not able to uh, run the two, the two stage vista square estimates because we, are, uh, we, are, we, we don't know about uh, their uh, pension receipts. Uh, status, we only know about the age. So uh, here we run the I ITT estimates. And the interesting, we find this uh, result, even though you know it's OLS, so it has a downgraded uh, effect compared to our two-stage least square estimates, but still the direction of the estimates are consistent with our baseline results. And also the pattern is also seems to be larger in the voice of sample and uh, also driven by the grandfathers 
uh, eligibility. So now we come to the mechanism. Why is that? Why we find the effect is more uh, salient uh, uh, in the boys of sample and why it is driven by the uh, by the males. We we examine the channel by uh, by four uh, by four mechanisms. Like uh, first the time allocation change and also the knowledge bias and the some preferences and also the income and household structure change. First, we examine whether this pension program will affect who are going to be their main child caregivers for their uh, children. Because the previous study have shown that living with the grandparents would have increased the child weight or obesity. So if they are more likely to be the main caregivers, uh, we are worried that they are, they are more likely to drive in our results. So, and then we don't find any effect that um, the grandparents being the, uh, being more likely to be the caregivers uh, for the children in our sample. And then we examine their uh, some preferences and the uh, knowledge bias. For the knowledge bias of the grandparents, the, the hypothesis is, is for, as following. If the grandparents have a biased knowledge towards how to raise or feed the grandchildren, then those two coinciding with the grandchildren for the subsamples that condition on the co-residence behavior between the grandparents and the grand grandchildren, we would have to observe a larger effect than our baseline results, right? And also for those who are mainly uh, the main caregivers for the children, we should also have observed a larger effect for the sample for subsamples condition on that uh, status. So, so here for the first uh, three columns in our uh, table, we examine the conditional subsample results and find it is uh, consistent with our expectation. And for those grandparents who co-reside with the grandchildren, or for those who are the main caregivers, especially at nighttime, the effect on the grandchildren, the children's first uh, BMI uh, Z score is actually much larger than our Ben's line estimate. And then we examine whether that is due to, you know, for the boys subsample, whether it, that is due to the sum preference. Because we know that we, uh, for the Confucius culture, we have our uh, ancestor worship. So we, the, the, the CFPS surveyed actually the house of the weather, they have uh, sort of ancestor worship behavior for the past, you know, years. And for those, who did have this kind of um, uh, behavior, we observe a much larger effect actually on the boys. But then for those who do not have such behaviors, interestingly, we find the effect is actually uh, much smaller, close to zero, but, uh, and also statistically insignificant. So this may, be, uh, may, may, may just uh, uh, correspond to our hypothesis that uh, this is due to some like cultural and also the sum preference due to the uh, cultural here. And also we examine whether a difference, uh, the effect by differentiating the gender uh, of the parents, uh, the, the, grand, uh, the, the, uh, the, the intermediate parents, which means that we differentiate father's father from mother's father. Because like the father's father, uh, uh, they may have stronger son preference due to because they have, you know, the, the grandsons would carry the family names. So as with our expectation, we find this effect more uh, salient for, um, uh, for, the, for the pension receipts of the father's father instead of the mother's father. So now we, uh, to, to the lastly, we examine the income effect and also household compensation. So here we use the adult sample instead of the child sample because for the child sample, uh, our outcome is the child. We link the child information to the household. So we are able to directly test the income effect using that child, uh, child sample. So we turn, turn to the adult sample in this uh, analysis to examine whether uh, the NRPS did increase the household income. So we use still, and similarly, we use the same strategy using the eligibility as the instrument for uh, NRPS pension receipt. And we find that actually in a, the first stage is also very similar, result very similar to the previous uh, result. Uh, and also we find that the NRPS pension receipt has increased the household income per capita by 
over a thousand. It's like a thousand six hundred yuan, which is much larger amount than the social pension income. Because the we 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 because this is uh, due to the partially due to the increase in the wage income in our sample. In the appendix of our study, we also show that um, uh, the the wage income in increases, uh, but with the even though with a large standard error, but it also increases, and it contributes to the overall household income increase. And then we examine whether the household. Um, adult migration increase or decrease due to this policy and also the coercive behavior of the grandparent of the grandson would have to be would have changed uh, because of the policy but unfortunately uh, but we don't find any uh, significant significant effect here they are very close to zero uh, no, no, now I conclude this uh, study. So NRPS have a positive effect on uh, short-term health status of grandchildren within the household. The effects are likely to be driven by male pensioners on boys. And then and RP, NRPS increases rural children's birth with, uh, overweight, uh, obesity rate, but do not decrease the underweight rate. And we do not observe any long-term effects of NRPS on the health of the grandchildren. And the effects are likely to be and uh, may not be a pure effect of pension income. It has mixed the channels uh, like uh, uh, such as uh, uh, some preference and also the knowledge bias to take care of the, to take care of the children. And thank you very much for uh, for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to uh, to discuss with, with me later. Um, and Monica. Can you hear me? Thank you, Jin Yang. Thank you so much for your presentation. Very challenging issues that you bring to us about China. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would like to invite Professor Cassio Turra uh, that is going to present about uh, the big picture in Brazil and demographics. So thank you so much, Professor Cassio. Good morning. Thank you so much. Monica for inviting me for this uh, for this seminar and thank you also for uh, putting together this this talks uh, so we can try to connect with our friends in China. Um, nice to meet you everyone in China. Uh, was a pleasure to to see the presentation from Professor Jing Wang. Um, it was my my understanding that we I should uh, present a more um, global perspective or global view of the uh, demographic change in Brazil and its potential relations with or connections with or interactions with the uh, economic or uh, social variables. Um, so what I'm going trying to do here is to give you more a broad broader picture. But I will try to connect uh, what we know in Brazil about Brazil in terms of intergenerational transfers with what uh, Professor Jing Wang just presented for China. Um, so, and um, I should emphasize that uh, uh, this is a presentation uh, conjoint with uh, Professor Simone Weim. So let me share my screen. Just a second. Yeah. Yeah, just a second, I change my Okay. No, 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 no. Just a second. No, I'm sharing the wrong screen.
No problem, it's gonna work. Can you see my my presentation? Yes, now it's okay. Yes, good. All right. All right. So I will start with the basics on on population dynamics for specifically for Brazil. But uh, so uh, it's it's really important to remember that we are facing a very uh, profound process of changes um, in the whole world. Uh, what we call in demography as uh, the demographic transition, right? So uh, this is a process where um, death rates and birth rates, both both of them um, um, change from very high levels to low levels. And this is has been a, a universal process. All countries in the world are experiencing this process. Uh, although, of course, uh, the timing and the pace of the demographic transition has been different across the globe. So it started in countries like Sweden, as we can see in the first uh, graph. Uh, and it's um, um, it, it has been much slower, a much, a much smoother process in Sweden. And uh, in countries like Sri Lanka, Brazil and China, uh, it has been a much more um, uh, accelerated uh, process, but also a late process compared to these European countries. But it's still uh, a very, uh, it involves very dramatic changes, um, and including uh, um, change in the, in, the, in the population growth rate, as we can see here for Brazil. So Brazil is in the it's it's it, it's in the second let's let's call it the second group in Latin America to experience the demographic transition. The first countries were Argentina, Uruguay, uh, Costa Rica, Cuba, and then came Brazil with Colombia, um, maybe Venezuela, and other countries. Um, but it's, we we so the, the demographic transition in Brazil started uh, around uh, the the 1930s and 1940s with the mortality decline. Uh, but uh, since then, the process has been very, very fast. And as we can see, uh, we are now approaching the point in the demographic transition when um, growth, uh, the growth rate, the demographic growth rate, it's, uh, uh, it's becoming close to zero. Uh, and then probably we'll have some negative growth in the in the last in the second half of this century of the current century, uh, we just have a, a, a new census in 2022, and the results um, uh, indicate that maybe the demographic transition has been even faster than first thought uh, or projected. As we can see here, these are projections by the UN. So maybe we are even going faster than we when we first than we first thought. But still, uh, we are still having getting some positive growth, uh, but approaching the zero growth. Uh, probably in 2040 or even before that, we are getting to the point where the crude death rate is equal to the crude birth rate, as we can see here in this, the left graph. So as we can see in the right uh, side graph, um, uh, there has been a really steady decline in the growth rate. We used to have around, used to experience around 3% of uh, population growth in the 1950s, 1960s. This is uh, also uh, the point where the global growth rate was the, uh, picked in the maximum. So in Brazil was the same. And since then we are declining steadily. So the base, the, in addition to the, to the decline in the growth rate, another consequence uh, that uh, it's really important for, for, I guess, for our discussion here is the change in the age structure. So this is also uh, po population projections from the UN. And as we can see, since the, the start of the century, of the century, Brazil has been witnessing um, decline in the proportion of the youth, of the, youth the young population, people aged zero to 24, basically. At the same time, the adult population has been increasing. This is exactly uh, uh, 
it coincides with the, 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 with the phenomenon that we call the first demographic dividend. But as you can see, uh, the adult population is starting to, is stopping to increase and probably will start to decline soon. Whereas the elderly population will keep growing in the next decades. So population aging is a, uh, it's a very important uh, uh, process underway in Brazil. Uh, the first demographic dividend is over, uh, which is the, the time of period when the active population grows faster relative to the dependent age groups, children and the elderly. So um, we, will, we're, we will end the time of opportunities, of economic opportunities from the demographic change, and we are starting... Um, a, a stage of, of deep challenges where Brazil will have to deal with a much larger uh, population, elderly population, not only in absolute terms, but also in relative terms. Um, just to make this even more uh, graphic, what you can see here is a, is a picture where is a, is a graph where we plotted the child dependence ratio the division of the number of people aged zero to 24 to, to act to the people, to adults in the y-x in the x-x we got the old age dependence ratio which is the division of uh, the number of elderly 65 and older in the number of adults so uh, these are all these little points are points for the, all countries in the world used the un estimate since 19, 1950 until to 2100. So as we can see, most of countries uh, re um, replace child dependence ratio by old age dependence ratio. Uh, we are um, emphasize some Latin American countries, including Brazil. So Brazil followed the same path. Uh, and this path also illustrates the first demographic dividend. Uh, as we can see, um, and the child dependence ratio first declines. Uh, so this is the, the famous window of opportunity uh, from the, demo, the golden age of the demographic area where the child dependence it declines without having an increase in the old age dependence ratio. So for many years, in the case of Brazil, 50 years, the child dependence ratio declined, also the total dependence ratio until only recently, the old age dependence ratio started to increase and start to increase very fast. And, uh, and now uh, this will provoke an increase, a new increase in the total dependence ratio. So we are changing child dependence by old age dependence. And uh, even in the case of Latin America, Brazil started, as I say, said, started late compared to Argentina, Uruguay. But now we expect that uh, uh, by the end of the century, uh, the population in Brazil becomes even older than this, than the population of these other countries. So it's really, it has been really fast in Brazil and Chile and Costa Rica in the case of Latin America. And, um, and, and this is important because when we think in terms of the economic consequence and uh, the need for public policies and things like that, we need to, to remember that Brazil didn't have the same amount of time to plan for this, uh, to this process as uh, countries like Argentina, Uruguay, and even, of course, uh, European countries. Right? So in, in Latin America, Brazil looks like more like, like uh, some Asian countries like uh, South Korea and even China, Taiwan and other countries uh, that have been experiencing also very fast demographic transition process. Uh, just to finish this point, I, I have this uh, graph of the old age dependence ratio, only the old age dependence ratio and here for the, 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 what we call the, the, the BRICS countries. Now there's a discussion about what, if, this, if, this, um, if this definition is good or not. But uh, as we can see, Brazil and China, this is very interesting, are um, experiencing very fast in, a very fast increase in the old age dependence ratio. Uh, faster than for Russia, India, and South Africa countries with all, 
all, also with large populations and and uh, emerging economies. So in the case of Brazil, our old age dependence ratio is going to multiply by three in 30, 30, 40 years. So it's it's really an amazing and astonished change that will have strong consequence for the country. So of course, this uh, this changes um, are more interest to be analyzed if we also think in terms of how people uh, live, uh, how people allocate resources, um, uh, what are the kind of public po policies in place, because they interact, these are the things, the economic uh, uh, profiles, economic process, social process that interact with the demographic change. So uh, I've been part of a um, um, very important research, international research project called the National Transfer Accounts that is led by professors Ronald Lee from the University of California and Andrew Mason from the University of Hawaii. And uh, they, we have in the, last, in the last 20 years, Brazil uh, was part of the first group of countries to participate in the project. We have been uh, trying to answer questions and build a method method methodology that could uh, help us uh, measure um, uh, the economic uh, life cycles in different countries and then interact with demographic changes and try to answer uh, some questions that we believe are fundamental to to the understanding of this uh, of the consequence of population age in the world. So uh, things like how do different age groups, including children and the elderly, acquire and use economic resources? One of the questions we have been trying to uh, understand, and we can see that it's really connected to what uh, Jin Wang just presented for China, where he's trying exactly to show how uh, transferring resources, public resources to the elderly may have impact in terms of allocation of, re of resources to children. So that's exactly what we're trying to do in this project, but looking more in a more macro perspective rather than in a more micro perspective. And so we are uh, so based on this uh, this methodology and and, and results, we um, um, have been addressing questions like the demographic dividends, economic growth, generational equity, financial markets, asset price, so all the consequences of population change, including for the sustainability of public and private uh, systems, yeah? and then and all the discussions about what kind of policy should be considered to be to 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 prepare the countries for the coming demographic change. In the case of CDPLAR, NTA is not the only project, of course, that uh, tries to connect uh, the demographic and economic change. So uh, uh, we have a tradition uh, in Brazil. Uh, especially in our program, in our demo, uh, demography program, we have a PhD demography program in CDPLAR, uh, graduate program in demography, which is really uh, well established. And it's an old program, it's a very international program where uh, people have been trying to connect uh, questions like the change in the labor market and uh, change in demography in demographic variables and economic consequences through the labor market uh, questions related to inequality to poverty and also as i say intergenerational transfer so there are a claim there is a really uh, a, a, um, um, a large agenda of research uh, that has been developed in the last uh, 40 years maybe um, since the 1960s, since, since CDPLAR started, uh, that tries to connect it how uh, the demographic and economic variables are connected. Uh, so uh, this is really in our, uh, in our uh, uh, agenda now. Um, this, so uh, because of the national transfer accounts, in the case of Brazil, have been able to uh, measure the economic life cycle. So this is what we call. This is a kind of a. It's 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 a, it's a it's a nice uh, statement that we in the NTA project like to do. The most important graph in the world. Of course, it's a kind of a joke, but uh, uh, it's a very important kind of uh, graph. It's a very important graph. Uh, the NTA uh, generated uh, 
uh, this kind of measurement of consumption and labor income by age, uh, so what we call the life cycle uh, income profiles, uh, main basic income profiles for um, almost 100 countries in the world, including China. And uh, so because of that, we have been able to measure uh, how much children and the elderly depend so this is the difference between the consumption labor income so how much they depend on the transfers or savings from adult ages um, and the methodology is really well established so we can have very comparable results for for these different countries um and we are measuring not only the basic income profiles, but also all the types of transfers or, or all the types of mechanisms, allocation mechanisms used by families and the public sector and the market to try to uh, smooth consumption over the life cycle and allocate the surplus that's typical from adult age to uh, the dependent age including to the elder and to the children, where the deaths, the, what we call the life cycle deaths are uh, when consumption is larger than, than income and people depend on other age groups. So this is important because as we can see from this, this is a per capita graph. It's, by, it's, it's, it's based on a per capita uh, analysis. Uh, but as we can see, um, um, it, it gives us a really... Uh, 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 impression how how demographic changes are important. So we once when we have more children, relatively more children, when uh, in the first stage of the demographic transition, um, there uh, there is a demand for consumption uh, that has to be um, provided by adults, a higher demand. And then comes the, what we call the phase of the golden age or the, the window of opportunity or the demographic bonds, whatever, when we have uh, relatively more people or a growing population at adult age, when uh, we have a surplus being produced. And this can be beneficial for the economy if well, uh, well used, well allocated for increasing productivity and uh, reducing inequality, things like that. And then... And uh, once the population ages, we start to getting again uh, increase uh, demand for consumption that will require from the economy a larger effort to keep uh, the, the, the levels of, of well-being in, in, in the society. It, uh, I, I'm not going into the details of the methodology, but um, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's really intense because you have to measure all kinds, we try to measure most of the main flows that, uh, occur, that occur across the life cycle uh, and have to implement this in different countries using administrative data, using household uh, surveys and things like that. Uh, but uh, the, the, the project is a success in terms of producing comparable results. So in the case of Brazil, uh, uh, so in Brazil is a very special case in the NTA project. It's a special case, uh, Zhang Yang and friends from China, because Brazil has uh, developed a, a welfare public system decades before getting older. And it has uh, went to a direction where the elderly uh, got larger shares of the public transfers than children. So instead of making education universal first, when we were in the first stage of the demographic transition, uh, Brazil implemented a universal social security system uh, uh, more rapidly than than expanding the education system, uh, and then and then in the last decades the education system and the health uh, public problem programs pub were also expanded, and so we can kind of have a, like a simultaneous expansion of public problem programs 
since the 1980, since 1988, when we have our uh, last constitution, federal constitution that established this, 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 this rules for the public programs. So we have this huge increase in the public sector in terms of fiscal spending. And, uh, and most of it was devoted or allocated to the elderly, although also we have been uh, getting expansions uh, in terms of the educational system and the health, pub, the public health system. So when you look at the life cycle deaths in Brazil here in this black line, so these are deficits at the start and end of life, and then you have a surplus at adult ages. As we can see in case of the elderly, this is for 2018, these are data. We have estimates, uh, this kind of estimates since uh, for 1996, for 2002, and now we are working on this 2018 uh, new measure. So this is still, it's still preliminary. We still have to work on some of this noise here, but as we can see, most of the consumption deficit among the elderly in Brazil is funded by public transfers. Okay, this is the average person in Brazil, uh, but this is true for mo for all uh, uh, social economic groups who have done this by social economic groups, and it's also true. Whereas among children, private transfers that's in blue. Uh, represents a much larger share of the deficit. So this has been like that since 1996. As I said, we, we are building like historical series from these estimates. And this is the picture in Brazil. Uh, this is important, again, because we are looking here at per capita basis. So once we have all that transformations, those transformations that I mentioned in the, in the first slides of my presentations, uh, we are going to have a huge pressure on public transfers, on fiscal fiscal pressures in Brazil because of population aging, given the kind of structure that we have in terms of allocation of resources in Brazil. So Brazil, to give like a summary uh, of, that, of that figure, it, it has a large public sector, about... Um, almost 13% of GDP, it's allocated on social security, and these include private workers and uh, civil servants and military. 5%, about 5% is spent on education, 3.5 or 4% of the GDP on health. This, this, this figures change a little bit depending on the kind of methodology used to measure them. So it's a very generous public sector universal, free health care, social, social security benefits to everyone, to all workers, uh, including non-contributory uh, benefits. Um, and, and we have had, like, it's, it's characterized by high replacement rates, in, especially for civil servants. Um, uh, at the same time, you have one of the most extreme inequalities in the world. Our Gini coefficient is really high, and higher, higher than the average for Latin America. We have declined, but still high poverty rates. The first, as I, as I already emphasized, the first demographic dividend is over and population is rapidly aging. So we have a scenario where we have a very large and generous public sector. Uh, we still have we were not able, even with this huge public sector, to eliminate uh, or to reduce uh, significantly inequality and, re and eliminate poverty. The first demographic dividend is over. So demographic changes are now going to work in the opposite problem, the more and more in terms of uh, putting obstacles than helping us to save, to, to solve this, all these issues. Uh, specifically about the social security systems, um, I should emphasize that they are unfunded. So I think this is important because um, I understand that you are interesting, interested in, in, in the social security, uh, in the pension system. So we have an unfunded, unbalanced, uh, defined benefit programs, pay-as-you-go systems. Uh, so these are huge systems. So we have one entire for private workers, and there are different uh, rules for different types of workers, occupations, um, for men and women, 
Uh, there is also one part of it that's uh, related to combat poverty, specifically to combat poverty, and it's based on non-contributory uh, benefits. And we have a, 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 at least two or three others for public, for for civil servants, for for uh, workers in the public service, including the military civil servants. And the rules here are really, really generous, especially for generations that entered in the public service until the, 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 the years, the 2000s, 2010s, when people could get 100% replacement rate. So they get the last wage, everything on a pay-as-you-go system. There has been a social. There was a social security reform in nineteen in twenty nineteen uh, that increasing that increased the age at retirement, increased contribution rates, the number of years required at, at work before retirement, that reduced retirement benefits, the reduced survival benefits. We used to have one hundred percent survival benefit. Now it's fifty percent plus a. Um, 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 10% for each dependent as well. A fixed amount plus a, a, a non-fixed amount depends on the number of the dependents. There's a, there are now new limitations to accumulate benefits. People could accumulate benefits, like someone could have like a retirement benefit plus a survival benefit. So these things have been changing, changed in Brazil in 2019, but you still probably gonna have to need more reforms in order to deal with population age. In the case of civil servants, they're having a really important transition from DB to DC plans. Okay, so we're starting to have DC plans for civil servants. But it's going to take time because this is uh, just for the new generation. So it's a, it's a really slow transition that just started. All right, so uh, we're facing a world with the emergence of age economies in Brazil, and I believe China is not, they are, they are also not different from the rest of the world. So we are approaching a point where, uh, as, I, as I show in the, with the NTA figure, that we're going to have more economies where the aggregate consumption by older persons uh, will exceed that of children, then the opposite. Um, so the next years, uh, the next days are going to really going to be really a very important uh, um, changing point for the world in terms of the how economies will deal with the population aging. Um, coming back to Brazil, I just want to to emphasize that this age economy, uh, in the case of Brazil, is a historical phenomenon. So as I said. Uh, we, we allocated more public resource to the elders than children. And this has been something that we have been developing uh, in the last uh, decades. These points represent uh, the relation between net public transfers to the elderly versus net public transfers to the youth. And as we can see, uh, and these points uh, go back way to the first decades of the 20th century. So we were able to produce like historical try, we try. We try to uh, generate these estimates of this uh, public trust to the elders versus to the children uh, since uh, for the last 100 years. And as we can see, Brazil has been, uh, the, 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 the relations really in favor of the elderly compared to the youth in the last uh, 40 years, at least. And this has been a historical process. And, and uh, the, region, the, re the reason is the expansion of social security uh, and uh, the, the, the public health system since the 1970s. So there is no country in our NTA project, which includes almost 100 countries, as I said, that has this kind of relation. It's like six times more public transfers to the elder than to children. Even Sweden, um, German, um, countries that have well-established welfare systems, okay? So this is really important in case of Brazil and is a kind of a pol political decisions that we took decades ago before population aging was happening. And now we have to deal with this issue. It was important, I must, I must emphasize that otherwise uh, people will, I mean, there are, there are benefits from this. One is we, we have really low poverty rates among the elderly. 
in Brazil. So uh, the, uh, the the international institutions like to to emphasize how much Brazil is uh, is uh, is different from other countries because it has this uh, the social this welfare systems that protect the elder, and that's true. That's really true. Uh, but there are a lot of inequalities between the social security systems. Uh, there are inequalities, important inequalities, as you can see in this graph, between uh, the resource allocated to the elder and the children. So we have many different problems here, uh, in addition to the benefits of combating poverty among the elderly. Okay, we were able to build this 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 uh, uh, structure. First, because we decide to allocate resources to the elder, but also because we had in the last decade an increase in the adult population in relative terms. So I don't want you to, 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 to spend much time here in this table, but what is showing is a kind of a decomposition that we did uh, some years ago, trying to show how much of the difference between net public transfers to, to, to each different age group has to do with change in the age structure and change in policies. And uh, as we can see, we increase, expanded the public sector a lot because we had a population at age 20 to 59, those who pay the taxes increasing. This is negative because these people are paying net transfers. So, uh, uh, more, more than half of the difference they paid between 1996 and 2011 was due to the fact that we are getting more adults. And this is coming to an end. So there is not more in uh, what we try to show here. And uh, there is not more, there is not uh, enough space more in terms of the future to, to provide resources to the elder and children from the demographic transition. We cannot get that anymore. So uh, we are in our limits. And in fact, the if we think in terms of the best age structure or age composition of the population in fiscal terms, when it com we combine our profiles and profiles for these different countries with the population uh, age structures, uh, we see that in case of Brazil and many countries in Latin America, uh, the most favorable age structure is gone, it's passed, was in, in the year 2000. And this problem not, are not going back, so we need to change our policies. All right, so uh, I'm, 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 I'm concluding this part, and then I have a few, a few slides only on family composition, but um, I want to, just to share with you some, some projections, there are a few projections that have been uh, developed for the for public uh, expanding in Brazil. It is uh, a combination of uh, uh, results from one one um, one project that I participated, and um, but you can it, it may, they may have some bias because things are changing because of the social security reform. But as we can see, there are important things that will different force in place with the demographic change. And even this, this projections, projections also consider potentials increase in, 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 in rate, utilization rates. So utilization rates in the education, in healthcare, in, 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 in the case of pensions, there is not, uh, it's almost universal, but we, we try to also to incorporate that. So in the case of education, there is a strong force. This is in terms of the percent of DGP. Uh, we also consider the economic growth. So this is not just uh, the, the spending, but also uh, it also considers the potential growth in the GDP. And this was a, a, a work that I have been doing for two other colleagues in Brazil. Uh, and as we can see, education, there's a strong uh, force to reduce spending on education in Brazil, even if we consider an increase uh, in, in utilization rates. So more people, uh, 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 more children in schools, attendance rates, rates higher, even considering that uh, the reduction in the number, relative number, absolute and relative number of children and youth is so huge that there is a strong. The question I put here is this in red, he's higher 
And because I doubt that uh, we were able to reduce the budget uh, to education, even with this positive effect in that case, coming from the demographic change. Same is true for healthcare. I don't believe, uh, I believe that these budgets will are much way more inelastic than we think. So uh, probably we are not be able to get some, some savings, let's say from reducing, uh, from, from having much fewer children in, 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 in Brazil. Uh, I doubt that we're going to be able to resolve. At the same time, there is a strong pressure to increase the spending on the on these are our uh, pension systems, non-contributory. This is a contributory, contributory, private, private and civil servants. Uh, we project that they're going to be really high, but this was before the social security reform. So if we consider social security reform, uh, the, uh, the, the the official projections estimate 13 percent but this is still a really important increase uh compared to what we have now so probably going to have additional ref need additional reforms in the next years as we can see there's a strong pressure coming from here um even for the from the non-contributory this is a non-contributory cash transfers to the, the to the youth as we can see is much way smaller than the, the 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 ones for the elderly. Uh, the, again, this the, the the decline in the number of children may um, uh, reduce the spending here, but I uh, probably uh, will not be able to manage resource here. And so we can expect from population age an increase, an important increase uh, in social spending coming uh, in the next decades. And this, we have to deal with that. And there is an extra point, and then I'm going to end my presentation with that, that's related to long-term care. We don't have, so in Brazil, we have public health system, we have a public education system, and we have cash transfers to the elderly um, that are very generous and, and, and very generous. But we don't have a long-term care and families are getting smaller. And so when we project a, uh, a possible policy, long-term care policy into the future, we will need probably around the, another two percentage points of the GDP in spending uh, to, to face this, this demand for long-term care that we don't have. So in, we decided in Brazil to transfer cash, provide health services, but not to provide care uh, for the elderly, this is really important, and probably this is going to be an extra, um, extra spending that we will need, and especially important because we have been facing really important changes in Brazilian families, and this is related to the demographic transition, of course. So we have fewer children, longer lives, and more transitions in and out of marriage, many kinds of marriage. So there are demographic, there are behavioral changes happening in Brazil that are making our families smaller. There are rising the number of people living alone, the number of single parents or parents with no kids, the number of blended families, and therefore increasing the diversity of families across the, the life cycle. Uh, so the, the, the classical married couple with children here in purple, it's declined, the prevalence is declined over time. There has been increasing the extended family in he, Yang Yang. Yan. One part of this extended family uh, group, it's, it's composed of skip generations, which are exactly what we were showing for China, which are grandchildren living with grandparents. So we also have this phenomenon in Brazil, um, uh, uh, and it's increasing, whereas at the same time, it's increasing the number of single parent households and one person household. Here in the one person household where we have more the elderly, so people living alone, the proportion of people who live alone is increasing, uh, especially among the elderly, as we can see here. So especially among the women, because we have uh, the effect of mortality here also. Uh, so uh, as population aids, we're gonna get more one person families, uh, people living alone. We are uh, transferring cash 
because of this huge public uh, uh, pension systems, but we don't have in place um, uh, long-term care. And we, do, we even don't have like strong care programs for children or people with disabilities. We uh, not uh, for the elderly. So we we, I mean, we don't we don't have in Brazil a really a care policy in place. And we believe that this is going to be the next really strong agenda in terms of the demographic economic relationships for the future. Um, I, this is my uh, uh, my. Just this slide in the last one. This is really uh, something that we are, have been working with. We are trying to measure simultaneously paid care and unpaid care in Brazil. Uh, it's difficult because we need to use different household service. And then we match them. We put data in one, getting data from the other. But this shows a really important picture in Brazil, in Brazil that's related to what I said in terms of the pension system and the, the type of allocations that you do uh, for the public, public system. Here, we're talking about care, so there's no public, public care here. It's just paid care is what people are paying in terms of pi private care. Um, and unpaid care is the care that's provided um, directed by members of the family uh, in non um, non uh, in unpaid domestic work so uh, and this is um, this is um, uh, showed by per capita income household can quantile so as we can see most of the care in Brazil until the quintile 85 uh, is provided by family members. And Jinyan, this is connected to your study. Why? Because when we have uh, we have uh, have conducted some works in Cede Plas showing exactly what you try you 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 you, you did uh, very well and uh, very well done in your work, trying to show how the expansion of the public sector in Brazil uh, change household composition that is related to care. And and inter inter household transfers between households, not intra inter, and we we got a positive effect. So when the public public system pension system in Brazil increased, uh, increased the cohabitation of different generations in Brazil, particularly in smaller cities, and also there was an impact in terms of inter inter household and intra household transfers. Uh, but uh, we didn't measure yet the impact on care because you see the cohabitation of different generations in a way uh, the elderly provide the young generations with monetary of transfers or paying for uh, electricity, water, supplies, etc. Whereas the youth cohabitating with the elderly provide uh, families, uh, provide the elderly with care. That probably that these ex these things even be, even if people are living in different households, these changes this these exchanges are happening. Uh, we are trying so we try to measure that now, but we need to to think that if families are getting smaller, so if the next generation are, are get, really getting smaller, this is the same for for China, we will probably going to need some kind of public program. Otherwise, all this work that has been done, as we can see by this graph, by family members, even in, 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 in strengthened by the, the, the indirect effect of the pension systems, as you show for the China and same for Brazil, are not going to work anymore because you're not going to have like enough children, enough grandchildren to provide the care for the elders. So this is something that, and as you can see, is really an equal. Those who have money can buy the services. Those who don't have the money need the family members. So we need the public uh, care policy for Brazil. So because uh, population is rapidly aging, there is the absence of a formal caregiving system in Brazil. There's increasing number of elders living alone or in small families. So we really, driving the country towards an unsustainable aging crisis. Uh, this is a kind of pessimistic maybe statement, but um, it's important to alert people about that. So now the Brazilian government is developing a national care policy, the current Brazilian government. It's at least discussing a potential national care policy 
that will try to protect the health of vulnerable populations, including the elderly and individuals with disability and children. So this is probably have a more effect for the low income families, as we see in the last graph, who are those who, who where care is provided predominantly by family members, especially by women. So that's all. Uh, I try to to give you like a big picture what of potential questions and the big big picture in Brazil. Um, and I, I must emphasize that we do have like uh, papers uh, attempt to measure the impact of public policies and in intergenerational transitions and the well-being of children and vice versa. We have been working on these specific questions as well. So I believe that there is a, a lot of um, questions that are common to our countries and then we can uh, try to discuss potential connections and interactions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Cassio uh, and Professor Jinian for the challenging presentations. I think that we have lots of things to discuss. I'd like to open the discussion time. And, and first I, I would like to invite Simone if she wants to add some something or to make a question for Jin Yang or we'll discuss. Thank you, Simone Weiman, Professor Simone Weiman from Sadepla. Thank you, Monica. Um, yeah, I, I just want to, to say that it's very interesting um, uh, discussion here. I think the, the points uh, that uh, Cassio and Professor Gidi Young uh, uh, brought together was very, very interesting. And I, I only add, want to add some point to what Cassio was um, uh, explaining about uh, this, this uh, care policy that Brazilian government want to put now on the agenda. I, I, we are not very sure if it will be work, if, if it will work uh, as we want, but it's a, uh, we hope that it, we can uh, build something that that will give some uh, some kind of solution for a problem that we have uh, related to to adult uh, population, but more than that, re related to the burden that women um, have on this kind of transfers of care because all the care, as we know, uh, most all the, uh, mostly all the care is uh, made by women. And this kind of policy want to alleviate this burden on women, especially poor women, uh, women in the poor uh, uh, households. Because as, we, as Cassio, um, brought in a, in a graph, the, the, the last figure, uh, the, the poor families are completely um, under the pressure of the, the work, uh, the, the, the production of care inside home. So people are producing all the care for young people, for adult people, for people with disabilities, all the care is provided inside home. And this care is provided by women especially, which um, prevent that women to go to labor market. So we have this kind of uh, effect, negative effect on the uh, income, supplementary income that these women can uh, provide for their for their households. It's an important issue that we are trying to working on and to measure this, uh, this side effect, this collateral um, negative effect on poor families, just um, uh, making the inequality uh, greater than 
as we have now. Just at this point, I would like to add. Thank you so much, thank, Simone. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Jin Yang, uh, do you want to uh, do some questions for Professor Castro and Professor Simone, please? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I really appreciate um, the fantastic uh, speech from uh, Professor Simone and from uh, Casillo. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor, especially C Professor Casillo, uh, give a very comprehensive and a broad picture of what is, uh, what is happening and what was happening in Brazil right now from the perspective of their dependency, including their child dependency and old age dependency to the, uh, the, the, transfer, uh, poli uh, the transfer policies and to the social pension program and to their household structure and the most concerning problems that is, uh, fa uh, that is facing uh, Brazil. And among those uh, interesting facts and uh, 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 and the questions, I may I may have a um, have a question on like uh, so what is the rule actually of the immigration uh, in Brazil? Is that a significant uh, factor uh, that when you present those uh, facts on the including the population aging, including the structure? Uh, ha have you also experienced a, a large share of immigration out of the country or into the country, or is that a, 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 a is that a fact in, in your country in Brazil? And also, I'm, I'm very uh, I was very shocked by their actually or by their inequalities in Brazil, which uh, you presented that the Gini coefficient is at one point five to point six. But however, on the, at the same time, you have a very generous public transfer program. But usually in, uh, we, we, we have a, like, a, not a common sense, but we have like intuition that when the public transfer is playing a more important rule in address the, you know, the poverty problems or in address the, you know, inequalities, then the, the total inequality of the economy should be decreasing accompanied by the increasing of the public transfer programs. But why is that that you know in Brazil the inequality is still um, well above a global average or countries at a similar level uh, to uh, Brazil? That is sort of the puzzle it seems to me. Uh, and also other, uh, so uh, also Professor um, Casillo uh, presented a very um, nice and a very fantastic picture about you know the transfer from mainly child dependency to their old age dependency. And I was I would like to I, I'm curious about you know when is that turning point? Uh, what, what what time you know, and when is that turning point that from uh, you know the the the, the mainly you know child dependency to an old age policy uh, dependency. And uh, that maybe uh, helped me you know, understand what is the, you know, the, the, the baby boom as, is that the same as uh, with other countries like during the second world war or not? Um, so that's my questions and uh, comments. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Jean, and thank you for your questions. Excellent questions. And um, um, so re regarding migration, Brazil is what we call in demography, it's, clo it's, it's, it's almost a closed population. So it, we used to receive migrants um, in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Uh, we used we, we received many um, um Italians, Spanish, Polish, Japanese, um, Portuguese, and so on. But since the, the end of the Second World War, uh, in terms of international migration, Brazil has been uh, almost like a closed population. Although in recent decades, we start to um, um, 
missing population to so people start emigrating from Brazil to North America and to Europe. Uh, this is still not um, very important in terms of population growth or change in, in, in population age structure. But um, I would say that uh, for some specific areas in Brazil where most of the immigrants um, originate, um, um, international migration is important for the economy, for example. So, for example, in, in the, where we are in Brazil, in the Minas Gerais state, there are some cities where most of the migrants in, that went to the United States originated and they their remittance and things like that. So people have been studying the, the role of remittance and, and the role of capital investments coming from this remittance in those areas. But in terms of the national demographic uh, dynamics, it's, it's, it's less important than the reduction in fertility and mortality in relative terms. And, and also the, 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 the issues, policy issues related to what we uh, face in terms of migration in our frontiers. So with Venezuela and um, Bolivia and so uh, 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 so with South American countries. So we have like uh, um, uh, issues, specific issues related to that, but not in terms of um, the huge transformations, demographic tr transformations that were more due to the demographic transition. On the same time, internal migration has been really important uh, in the last uh, 50 years, since the 1970s. So there have been a lot of movements from the Northeast to the Southeast, from Northeast to the North, from the South to the, to the agricultural frontiers in the center west, in the north of Brazil, in the Amazon region. So this kind of movements have been really important in terms of um, reallocated people within the Brazilian territory. Um, uh, what we are projecting, so the demographers are projecting that this, this movement stride uh, uh, will probably tend to uh, lose momentum and then become and we start getting like the net uh, migration rates for each state in Brazil close to zero in the future, which is usually what a kind of assumption that demographers like to do. But it's it's getting it's it's getting uh, smaller. The movements are getting it's getting it's, it's losing strength. Uh, your second question was about uh, mm -hmm. the why Asi que falasse. You do want uh, to just to just to add something that skip generation um, uh, household is a direct product of uh, migration, uh, especially in internal migration, because parents go to uh, usually urban areas because of uh, employment, and then the, the, the coresces uh, between uh, children and their grandparents, uh, it's only um, the product of this. Not only, but the pre, the, the most important uh, factor is this. Excellent, right? excellent, excellent point. Thank you. Yeah, excellent point. And um, all right. So you ask about why we why we have such a huge public sector, so much social spending and inequality so high. Um, taxes are really regressive in Brazil. So we are trying to do like a tax reform in Brazil. So one, we have regret. So spending is regressive in Brazil, and tax and co the collection of taxes is regressive. So we have, we have inequalities being produced by the state in both sides of the public sector when collecting the taxes, when spending the taxes. Um, I, there's one study that we have we have done for comparing Brazil and Chile for the World Bank, where we try to. To, to look at the incidence of public transfers by sector, by function, by age and income quintiles. And uh, the social security system is regressive. Uh, the educational system is regressive. The health, public health system is the one more neutral in Brazil uh, in terms of spending. But in terms of collection taxes, uh, we have a very regressive taxes. So in a way, public transfers in Brazil, I, deteriorating inequality and increasing inequality you see unfortunately this is really hard to change 
Do you want to add something, Simone? No, no, it's okay. I think it's okay. complete answer. And then, and then you ask about that uh, that point in time where child dependence ratio is declined fast with no increase in, in old age dependence ratio, and then we start to have an old age dependence ratio yes. increase. Mm -hmm. Usually, Jiang, it usually lasts for about for for the for the for emerging economies. So, so countries like Brazil, Colombia, maybe maybe China. I don't I don't have that on, on the top of my mind. But for these countries that where the demographic transition started, like uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, it usually takes around 50 years that window, 50 mm -hmm. five decades. Five so in the case of Brazil, it started in 1970, 1970, and then it lasts until 2020. It's kind of over. So, uh, but it's, a, I mean, I mean it, people have like, a, sometimes people have a very pessimistic view of the, the demographic bond. Say, ah, it's over. We didn't get uh, wealth enough, etc. But we need to remind that there have been important transformations in these countries, including Brazil. Brazil was a very different country in 1970. The same for China, of course. And uh, and uh, uh, the role of demographic changes should not be underestimated in these last 50 years. So we have, I mean, we have uh, almost 100% attendance rate uh, for children in school. Uh, quality is still not very good, but in terms of quantity, we were able to change. Of course, demographic change helped. Uh, we were able to build like a public health system. Uh, of course, reducing the number of children uh, or babies were important, was important. Uh, poverty rates declined. Uh, of course, this was important, important in the demographic change. So the demographic dividend or bonus, whatever, dividends, they played a role. If uh, the question is what we could have uh, done better, uh, of course, uh, we can always, uh, we didn't get the, uh, the whole potential. Uh, some countries like South Korea, in terms of economic growth, and even China, in terms of China, you were able to get even more from the demographic change that we were able to do it, especially in terms of economic growth yeah. and a problem in reducing inequality and so on. That was we, where we were, didn't do well. But yeah. we got some benefits. We, we get some benefits in the case of Brazil. There's no doubt. Now yeah, we face challenges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> only challenge. Thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot for your, you know, great answers. I think that really, uh, uh, you know, answer my questions. And I think, you know, uh, I you thank you for your, uh, you know, for your, for your, pra uh, for your praise of the China's economic growth in terms of also as well as the uh, demographic change. But to be honest, I think the situation here in terms of the population aging is even more pessimistic than the case in Brazil because at the same level of economic uh, development, like it's uh, across the country in the world, at the same level of GBT, GBT, uh, GB, uh, GDP per capita, we have the largest uh, you know, share of elder population in, their, in, in the world. And uh, you know, uh, one of the lowest fertility rate and it was the, and the fertility rate of, uh, during the past years due to the COVID, you know, pandemic is even uh, going down to an even lower turnoff. So that is really a worsening case here. So for the past year, the last year, uh, remar you know, uh, remarks, the, uh, the first year since, uh, I would say since maybe 100 years or since uh, over, like since the 1940s, that China's population actually was decreasing the first time in a long, long time that Chinese population is decreasing due to the low fertility rates and uh, uh, aging population. Yeah. And immigration also, right? Or no? And immigration, I, I, I would say immigration due to multiple reasons, uh, primarily because of the language. I think immigration is not a big 
uh, very major concern here. But there is some elites or uh, well-educated uh, people who migrate out of this uh, country, but the number uh, is limited uh, due to many reasons, especially the language. So I think the proportion of immigration out of this country is very limited compared to the total population. So that is not a, a very big concern, but mainly it's because the low fertility uh, rates during the past the years. So you you talked in your paper about uh, uh, co-residence and um, the effect of co-residence on the well-being of children and the pensions, etc. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit more in terms of how co how much co-residence co co is important? Because this is really a, a topic that we are interested here in Brazil. Uh, Simone has been working with this a lot. Yeah. As, so could you say a little bit in terms of how people... Uh, so this co-resident effect and how who cares and uh, who provides care in, in the household, things like that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I really I, I'm very interested because uh, Simone also provided some facts that the co-resident rate is actually increasing due to the internal migration that is happening in Brazil. But here the case in China, I think, is even more severe because uh, there are some like um, uh, threshold in the actually in the urban sectors uh, due to some lack of public services. For example, like for the children in the rural areas, uh, if they want to get access to the public education in the urban area, they have to register for their local, you know, household registration type. And that is very hard for some of the children to get, especially in the large cities like Beijing and Shanghai and some other uh, major cities. So especially for those, uh, they can some, somehow they can access to their primary um, school or secondary school, but they cannot access to the high school. But high school is very key because it determines where uh, it determines how you know whether you are going to enter the college or not, and whether and where you are going to going to uh, to do your uh, to finish your college's uh, college education. So. Due to this major reason, uh, educational reason, so many uh, children, they are left behind in the rural areas. So, mm -hmm. um, also there are some problems, uh, you know, for the, especially for the public education for their, you know, kindergarten children. They are, mm -hmm. um, they are hard to find a good, you know, uh, child care givers in the, you know, public child givers in the mm -hmm. urban sectors. So do these multiple reasons, they're more, there's a much larger share of the children that is left behind in the rural areas in China. And we have the, you know, one of the world's largest uh, rural to urban migration and also urban to rural migration during some major festival like the spring or Chinese New Year festival. On that, during that holiday, many of the, a large part of the population proportion of the population is actually migrating back from the urban areas to the rural areas. So you will basically see, uh, you know, a city with, you know, with, 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 with no people. <laughs> like if you come to visit China during the spring festival or during the Chinese New Year, no people on the street in the cities, but many of them in the rural areas. And that is an interesting phenomenon that is happening here. And due to this uh, you ask the question about the co-resident due to this, you know, multiple reasons, partially because this this internal migration, but the other major reason is that the, the Confucius norms on the multiple uh, generational, uh, multi-generational co-residents, because we've uh, put a very high value on, you know, filial purity, which is that you respect your uh, I, I I respect my parents and my parents respect my grandparents. So that you know, uh, they the people would give them uh, the how the family very high value if they you know can uh, show this kind of respect, and also the grandparents would be very willing to help their adult children to take care of the grandchildren. So that is also happening not only in the rural areas but in urban areas as well. So actually, the co-residence rate is kind of similar according to a recent national survey in China, which is called the CHOWS. The CHOWS survey shows that 
um, the, 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 in the urban areas, the multi-generational uh, co-residence is around 40%, but in the rural areas, it's only slightly higher, like 42 or 43. So actually in both areas, the co-residence is very common. So you will see that in not only in the rural, but in urban areas that, you know, many actually elderly people is actually taking care of the grandchildren in, in, in cities, in rural areas. And they should have a, their norm, um, you know, uh, or knowledge on how to raise the children would significantly affect how the children would be grown up. Yeah. So the impacts you're getting in your in your paper are really more important in that in that sense because if you get if you get that much multi generation co residence any effect on positive effect is in the case of Brazil is way less prevalent uh, mm -hmm. right Simone so so it's not forty percent uh, the multi generational I know so that's saying Mike. Yes, in Brazil is, is less prevalent. And ad additionally, uh, we have a, a trouble trying to capture this effect because many of the uh, transfers uh, between um, uh, elderly people with, with their grandchildren uh, is not uh, about co-residence. It's about that exchange from uh, uh, money and care. So it's it's possible between two uh, different households, uh, especially between uh, rich people. We have a very stratified society and uh, the coresness is much more common uh, uh, among uh, poor families. Among richer families, the, the transfers are made from one household to another household because uh, uh, elderly people live more alone or more only a couple and they can take care and transfer resources to grandchildren, but in another um, uh, uh, household. And we have a kind of difficulty in capture this data, the data of transfers between uh, uh, households is more difficult to, to, to see. Uh, so we have a little trouble doing this kind of measurement. But That's it's interesting. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's of course, it's, uh, it's very, very, important way of transfer a care a, a exchanging by money yes so like i think in your in the brazil case uh, as i have learned from both of you that uh, you know there especially the long term care is mainly provided by the household members right exactly so exactly. there is still an absence of the long term care insurance or long term care program Okay, I think in China on, on, on our side, I, I think we have launched a, a long-term care insurance program very least recently. I think it's uh, probably around the 2018 or some, some, sometime around that. And, but we still, it's under a pilot stage, which means that some cities are already uh, experimenting such a policies, especially in cities like Shanghai. They're already piloting such a long-term care insurance program, but it's still not a national program. But uh, th this is mainly because, like in China, we are facing a, a more severe, uh, severe uh, like uh, aging process. And also, uh, I think yeah, most of the long-term uh, care is pro provided now by the uh, like informal services from the household member, especially in the rural areas. And even though for those who do not coincide with their uh, parents, for example, due to their um, land institutions here, especially farmland institutions. So like the migration from one village to another village is very difficult, which means that this is due to because that usually um, the farmland is owned by the collective of the of the village and then it was elect, uh, allocated to the households within the village equally uh, according to the endowments of that village 
That is to say, um, if you want to migrate from one village to another, you are, will be you will be barred by this, you know, a farmland institution because you cannot easily get access to the farmland from the, from that village. It's except for marriage purposes or other, you know, uh, reasonable uh, reasons. So in that case, which means that even though some of the grand, uh, adult children, even though they do not coincide with their parents, but they live probably very close to their parents within the same village. And, and we, if we take that uh, into account as like a living proximity measure into our survey, then that measure of living proximity is over 80% in the rural areas. But it's not as that high in the urban areas because you know basically you can uh, move freely within the cities and, uh, and across cities. That's interesting. Thank you so much. This is a very hot discussion. <laughs> I'm so happy. Uh, Cassie, do you want to talk or, or can I open for one more question? No, open, open. I, I don't know if from the open audience, uh, is there anyone who wants to make one question for or I don't know if someone in the audience wants to. Okay, I don't think so. So, uh, okay, so I, I'm uh, Cassio and Simone. Do you want to add some some more things? Or no, I, I think we have very interesting uh, uh, topics that we can discuss. I'm. Uh, it's my understanding that Jin Yang is coming to Brazil at some point. Yes. Uh, yes. This semester, so it's going to be a pleasure, Jin Yang, to welcome you here in Belo Horizonte, and then we can talk, and then uh, we'll be. We'll be, we'll be Great to have you here. Okay, yeah. thank you. Looking forward to it very much. And I'm wow. very interested about this long-term uh, program you are talking about. If you can send us uh, some material or documents about this, I'm very, very interested. Sure, I will be. Uh, I will be collecting some of their information on great, their long-term care pilot great. program. Yeah. yeah, the long-term care really... here in Brazil is very, very, very low, and it's uh, mm -hmm. something that we 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 need to work uh, on because uh, it's a, a like important a deficit. Right. I'd like to see your your material about this. We have, we have to. You have many things to to talk when you visit. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, um... I would be happy to. Yeah. It'd be great. Well, I'm so happy because I think that we succeed in, in our purpose that was to introduce both groups themselves. I think that this was, was the idea with this workshops to put in touch people from HUST and from UFMG. And it was a great discussion. I'm so happy we have a big audience during all the time. So I'd like to thank you very much to Professor Ginny Young, Professor Simone Weimer, and Professor Cassio Turra. I'm so happy. So we are uh, finishing now. We will put the, some, somebody from, from the government, Sergio, ask it from the slides. So uh, if, you, if you think that you can share the slides, please, you can send it to me and, 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 yes. and I can send it to them. Or it, uh, uh, his email was in the chat. Uh, uh, and I, I, uh, Professor Jin Yang, uh, Cassio and Simone, Professor Jin Yang is coming with the HUS delegation in, in November. They will spend one week with us and we will have the 10th anniversary of the Confucius Institute. But we also have a, a, a symposium, a time for a symposium. So he is going to, to give a lecture for us. And, 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 and he is able to spend at least one or two days with you if you, if you have time. So I, I will Great. give more details to you and, and then we can, we, can, we can organize this and, and, and send details for Jin Yang. So thank you so much Great. for, I think that this is a, a, a big beginning of this partnership and, and I'm very happy that we succeed and thank you for, coming and embracing my ideas. <laughs>
Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, you, oh, you, you. do a very great job in organizing these <laughs> series of sessions. Yes, yes. And, and thank you for the audience. We we had a big audience and 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 here. So I stop.